Um, we have been in touch with Dr. Khan because he's an expert in the Delphi method, and we hope to use his methodology to help us reach consensus on the consortium and for eventually the diagnostic and treatment guideline updates. So um, we hope that he can share his expertise with us today. I'm going to record it for all of us that can't join, but um, and so I can rewatch it many times uh, to make sure that we have it down. And then I think in the future, we hope to partner with either Dr. Khan or one of his uh, proficient students to help lead um, this effort. So um, I think- And just a shout out to the Neuroimmune Foundation, Anna, who is funding this effort. So thank you, Anna. This is such an important effort and we really appreciate your support. Is Anna still on? Yeah, I she am. Is. Yeah. Oh, there you are. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Anna. Thank you. Okay, Dr. Khan, you can take it away whenever you're ready. Okay, so I'm going to share the screen and run uh, a PowerPoint slide set. I will also share the PowerPoint slide set uh, with Anne as a PDF file for uh, sharing with colleagues, uh, which could be handy when looking at the video being recorded just now. That sounds great. Thank you. Uh, okay, so uh, I'm also very happy to be interrupted at any stage during the presentation, uh, if you have any questions. Um, I want to talk generally about how consensus surveys are carried out and give you an example uh, of a recently conducted survey, which has been accepted for publication. So I'll run you through how that project went, because I believe what you intend to do is similar to, to, to this project. So I just to give you a bit more background about myself. First, um, I did medical school in Pakistan, which uh, I started in 83. And after finishing there, I worked for some time in Kenya. Uh, then I returned to Pakistan and then on to Canada, where I learned about research methodology and clinical epidemiology. Uh, and after spending nearly 25 years in the UK, including last 10 years there as a professor at Queen Mary University in London, about three years ago, I moved to University of Granada in Spain from uh, where I am joining this Zoom call. My first publication uh, was accepted and published in 1990. I performed my first systematic review and got that published in 1995. Since uh, that time, I have edited various journals, have written a book on systematic reviews, which is now in its third edition. Uh, and I was also chief editor of a journal for several years, quite uh, apart from being a clinician, uh, I have been active in research from what you have seen. I have also been director of research at two hospitals, so I understand uh, what is involved in the workplace with respect to research. And uh, with that background, I can just now move on to the consensus process. So with respect to consensus, I think it may be teaching grandma how to suck eggs, but I think it is relevant background that I wish to present now. Uh, what we call evidence-based medicine combines the art of practice of medicine with the science. The science comes from published papers and is put together in guidelines to deliver evidence-based medicine. However, there isn't always evidence available and there is still need for producing guidelines in this situation. So the potential benefit of guidelines are 
put simply, that they help to improve consistency of care with the hope of improving quality of care and health outcomes. Um, and the disadvantages potentially can be that if the recommendations in the guideline are far too influenced by a particular group or subgroup, then perhaps the guidelines may not be accepted or may be hard to implement. And uh, this may lead to poor practice and as well as waste of resources. So I give this background because I hope to emphasize how consensus can be used to avoid the difficulties that I have listed here in this slide. Now, before I talk about consensus, I think it's also important to see what research translation is, because the idea is that what we learn from lab physiology and other types of research, that this should ultimately improve healthcare. And then this goes through what is called research translation. Uh, I'm afraid if the terminology I use here is a bit different to that in the USA, uh, but, uh, but I hope it will make sense. The, the process goes through various steps. Uh, we go forward as well as backwards, but as long as we take more steps forward, we keep moving. And T1 translation relates to research that may not involve uh, humans. Mm -hmm. uh, from T2 onwards, we are talking about data collected through human studies. And at some stage, these collected data are synthesized and then put into a guideline. And this is called T4 translation. Now, I believe the circumstances you find yourself in is where you don't really have large multi-center clinical trials. Am I correct about that? Yeah. Yes. So in this case, really all the talk that we have of conducting phase one, two, three trials, then making guidelines and then running phase four trials, which is typical of uh, interventions based on drugs, may not be applicable in your situation. And you've got to make the guideline using the consensus of the experts in the field who may have various levels of evidence available to them. So the moment we start, start talking about consensus, here is a slide which shows that any recommendation, here we have some guideline recommendation statements concerning preterm delivery. And the same statement has different levels of grading depending on the system of grading employed. And I can also promise you that given the same system of grading with different people creating the same guideline using the same evidence, they might generate different statements or may assign different strength of uh, grading to the statements. So the problem we deal with the moment we have a group of people making recommendations is that they may disagree with each other. So the idea behind consensus guideline is that uh, when we do not have much evidence, there is a higher chance that there is disagreement amongst experts or the relevant parties. And then this may lead to a guideline. Uh, this may face difficulty in implementation. But if we can go through a consensus process and objectively deal with the disagreements, then hopefully we can have a guideline that has a stronger basis uh, that can be more easily accepted for implementation. Now, when there is no consensus, there are many people, many tests, many treatments, many referral chains, 
And I think we are familiar with the statement that too many cooks can spoil the broth. The knowledge we put together in guidelines really requires for the guideline to be persuasive. Because if it is not persuasive, there will be difficulty in making decisions with the information put together in the guideline and subsequently with implementation. And guideline and audit are linked to each other with what is called the standard against which practice is measured. The standard usually comes from a guideline and preferably a guideline that is developed through a proper consensus method. So here I just show you a quality improvement cycle. And here you can see that the standard, the word standard comes on various occasions. Uh, not only that we set standard, which you have done previously through your publications. And now what you are looking to do, if I understand right, is to update, to review and update those standards so that in the future, you can measure practice against the new standards. Have I understood the background correctly? Are there any comments to make on what I've said so far before I proceed further? I think you're on track. Thank you. OK, so I continue then in that case. Um, <clears throat> We now look at the consensus methods. Before we look at them, I like to highlight this to you. The dissemination of whatever we will come up with through our guidance document can follow one of these four paths. It can be taken up rapidly and completely and implemented, or it may be taken up slowly and completely and be implemented, but it may also end up being incompletely taken up. Or even after being taken up, it may be dropped or discontinued. So I hope that with the consensus approach that I'm going to highlight, we will hope to be somewhere in the zone A, or if not in A, at least in B, so that the coverage of the guideline following its publication and dissemination will be as complete as possible. The overview of the consensus process is uh, relatively straightforward. Got to dis decide on the scope. We've got to capture the existing knowledge. Then we've got to ask the relevant stakeholders, including experts and other relevant stakeholders who are not necessarily subject experts. And we, we're going to have an opportunity, hopefully, to discuss that later on today in the following my presentation. And then apply consensus methods so that any disagreements are resolved uh, in as objective a manner as possible. And finally, go through this process of uh, review, feedback, and updating, which I hope will happen some years down the road after your consensus has been developed. So with respect to the scope, I think it is relatively easy to see that there will be two or three broad categories within which recommendation statements will be created. And they will fall within the groups of diagnosis treatments and monitoring of treatments. Um, and perhaps there are some elements that you may wish to add to this list. For example, recommendations for future research or others where some tests, for example, have a diagnostic role, but they may also have a monitoring role. So you've got to think carefully about how you would want to present them. Similarly, sometimes a trial of treatment serves as a test. So you've got to think carefully about whether you're talking about treatment or using the treatment as a test. Uh, the, the, these are issues that you would know far better than I would concerning the condition we will be dealing with. Now, once we've outlined the scope, we got to update the literature review. And this is necessary to update the previous recommendations. 
but it is possible that in a field where much literature does not exist, the recommendations need to come from experts or people with lived experience of the condition or other care providers who are not necessarily experts. And this allows us to create a long list of recommendations on which the panel will apply the chosen consensus methodology and from the results and statistical analysis of the consensus methodology we can finalize a short list from the long list of consensus statements from which the final document of the guideline or consensus guideline can be prepared for dissemination now the issue of consensus panel is a difficult one because we are dealing with putting together a group of people who will help prioritize from the long list of recommendations that we will create in the project to create the short list and this prioritization will be provided in a particular manner uh, whereby they will score each statement for its importance or priority and this assessment is scientific but it is also personal and because in a circumstance where evidence cannot be helped to solve this personal disagreement we will hope to use the, the consensus scientific methodology to dissolve the disagreement it's a little bit like a referee in football could make a bad decision but then the 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 television technology can be used to help objectively deal with that bad decision uh, in this case uh, the results obtained from the various rounds of the survey that we might, uh, that we will undertake will help resolve the disagreement and i'll, and I'll show you some examples of that as we go forward so when creating the consensus panel think about all the relevant people who could be involved in the provision of care to the patient and here i list some that we have considered in previous consensus projects uh, for example this is a list that was relevant to a topic concerning chronic pelvic pain now involving patients or representatives of patients is a relatively new thing um, in indeed both the patients their representatives and clinicians and experts are learning how to work with each other better with every new project typically we think of patients serving with view to dissemination so that when the guideline is produced it should also be produced in a manner that uh, or in a language that it can be understood by patients but at the same time patients can also or their representatives can also contribute to valuing the various statements in the same way as experts would uh, in 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 the consensus project now i highlight this as an important feature because going forward description of patient and public involvement in publications is going to become standard in the same way as reporting of statistical methods in the method section of publications uh, has become standard in scientific literature so for example in this randomized control trial patient and public involvement has been described in the method section using a guideline for patient and public involvement called grip2 i think for our project we should also consider how we would formally involve patient and public in the creation of the guideline 